Thanks. 43 children per day in the US are diagnosed with cancer. But there's hope because 85% of those children will go on to survive that cancer diagnosis for more than five years. And this equates to one in every 250 adults in the US who have survived their cancer and gone on to live their lives. And the reason why we're able to accomplish this is because of the breakthroughs that are happening with modern medicine. And this includes radiation and chemotherapies that eradicate this cancer. However, these therapies also have off-target effects, and sometimes we see those effects in patients who lose their hair. But these therapies also can affect internal organs, the ovaries that produce the eggs in women and the testes that produce sperm in males. And so um, even uh, adults who survive their childhood cancer are less likely to get pregnant and more likely to have reduced sex hormone levels than their sibling counterparts. And that's because these organs, the testes and the ovaries, produce sex hormones that are essential for in initiating puberty and for maintaining bone, brain, and vascular health throughout an adult life. And so scientists saw this problem and tried to create some solutions. And this was uh, brought to the attention of scientists around the world. But here at Northwestern University, Teresa Woodruff developed the Oncofertility Consortium, oncologists coming together with fertility specialists to study preserving and restoring fertility and hormone function in patients who have damaged tissue from disease treatments. And in fact, now, if you are going to undergo some of these toxic therapies, it is highly recommended that you see a fertility specialist. So what will that fertility specialist tell you your options are for preserving your fertility later in life? If you are a male, then you'll be able to bank sperm. If you are a female, then you'll be able to bank eggs or fertilize those eggs with donor or partner sperm and bank embryos. However, this treatment or this procedure does not apply to all women. This process takes about a month and it requires hormonal stimulation. So you can imagine if you have an aggressive tumor, you cannot wait that time. And if you have a hormone responsive tumor, you should not be undergoing these treatments. There is another population, one that I mentioned right at the beginning, those 43 of, uh, children per day in the US who get cancer diagnoses. And so these young infants and girls don't yet produce eggs because they do not, have not gone through puberty. And so what are their options? Right now, under an experimental procedure, we can remove one of their ovaries, or we can remove the ovarian tissue strips and cryopreserve those for later. And why would we do this? Well, this tissue has an abundance of this type of cell, the oocyte, which is the potential egg cell. And in fact, this young girl or this infant will have the most number of oocytes or potential egg cells than she will have in her entire life. And this is because women, us, we have a natural decline of our potential egg cells over time. And around the average age of 50, this ceases. And so this is when we undergo menopause. Because of this uh, decline in the natural oocyte number, we can predict that, for example, if a 12-year-old was to have radiation, her oocyte number will decline enough that she may enter menopause at 19 and a half years old. Now, this is a moderate level of radiation, and this is an example using a prediction model by Wallace and Kelsey. And so can you imagine that at 19 and a half years old, she is no longer fertile, and now she has to go through uh, sex hormone replacement therapies for the rest of her life to maintain that bone health. And so let's say she was at Northwestern and we offered her the option of preserving her ovarian tissue prior to this treatment. Well, across the world and including in the US, there are some experimental procedures in which we could take that tissue later on and transplant that back in. And now there's been such great promise with this because it's resulted in over 60 live births and restoration of se several years of sex hormone stimulation. 
However, in many cases, like this example that I'm showing, that ovarian tissue can have metastatic cancer. So as you recall, we reserved this tissue prior to her cancer treatment. So this is something that we would not want to transplant back in. And this is a problem that we look at and we have to do better. So we sought to develop the ovary bioprosthesis. Now, let's think about how we would construct this. So we had to think beyond the boundaries, like today's theme, of developing this type of organ because it is not skin, it's not cartilage, it's not a flat type of cell, it doesn't require a flat scaffold because the major unit, functioning unit of the ovary is the follicle, and it's a sphere. It has the centralized oocyte, or that potential egg cell, surrounded by many support cells, the somatic cells, and these support cells produce the sex hormones in response to signals from the pituitary. And this cell connection between the oocyte and the support cells is essential for developing that potential egg cell, or the oocyte, into a fertilizable egg. So we need to maintain this spherical shape. So when we thought about building a scaffold that would hold these follicles, um, we also thought of other, other criteria that we need to meet. So this scaffold needs to be rigid. We need to be able to transplant this back in. It has to be porous. It needs to allow for neutral, nutrient exchange and nutrient flow. And of course, we wanted to ovulate that egg. And it has to be dynamic. And so when we were thinking about this problem, I'm going to describe our solutions that is really a true collaboration between members of the Woodruff Lab. Um, Kelly Whelan is shown here, and I'm also in the Woodruff Lab. And we sought the expertise of material scientists and engineers in Ramil Shah's lab. I'm showing Adam uh, Jakus and Alexandra Rutz. And so together, we thought that we could solve this scaffold dilemma with 3D printing. And so I'm showing our 3D printing here um, in Ramil Shah's lab. And we decided that we needed the material that we were going to print to be bioactive. So this follicle that I mentioned starts at 35 microns in diameter and it grows over 600 times to about 20 millimeters in diameter, which is larger than the diameter of a penny. And so this scaffold has to be dynamic. Our cells need to interact with it. And so we chose gelatin. We chose gelatin because it's a derivative of collagen, which is the most abundant scaffold protein in the body. And so I'm showing um, one of our architectural designs on the bottom printed by Alex. And so when we put our follicles inside this scaffold, we tested several architectures, and we found that our follicles really liked to feel snug, but still have room to grow. And so you can see that that sphere is still maintained when the, within this scaffold architecture, and the oocyte is healthy enough, those cell contacts are still maintained, and we know this because when we triggered it with the um, pituitary hormone LH, we were able to ovulate an egg right through this scaffold. And so this was so exciting when we saw this in the dish, and we immediately moved into animal models of um, uh, human infertility. And so we removed the ovaries of mice, and we created an ovary bioprosthesis with green fluorescent protein-containing follicles. So you can see the follicles are glowing bright green. They're inside the nat natural site of where the ovary was that was removed. And you can see the oviduct in the bottom, which is the equivalent of the human fallopian tube, where the egg is released into this tube and then fertilized. So we maintain that whole female reproductive tract intact. And when we mated these mice, they produced green pups. And so yeah, we were so excited. Um, and so this green pup shows that the eggs were ovulated from this scaffold into the fallopian tube that our bioprosthesis it was able to produce enough progesterone to allow that uh, fertilized embryo to implant into the uterine wall. It also triggered milk production from the mother, and the pup was matured and was able to sire green fluorescent protein pups of his own. <laughs> so I'm showing you grand pups of that original transplant. And so you're probably 
you sound as excited as we were. <laughs> um, but this is mice, right? What do we do for humans? And so I mentioned that we're using a 3D printed scaffold, and this can be scalable to humans. This can be changed. The architectures can be changed on demand. The materials can be changed. But we're also using gelatin, which has FDA approved uses, so we're on our way. But also in the Woodruff lab, we're taking a portion of that research tissue that we're collecting, um, and I'm showing you a piece of that ovarian cortex here, and you can see those oocytes are there, and we're developing ways to safely isolate those human follicles in the same way that we did with the mice. So the next steps would be to put these follicles into those 3D printed scaffolds. But what if um, that cancer patient wasn't able to preserve her ovaries? Or perhaps um, because of genetic diseases, they didn't have ovaries. Well, we're developing clinical grade techniques to develop human stem cells, stem cells that we can get from the patient themselves, derive them from their skin cells, say, and differentiate them into the sex hormone producing cells of the ovary and perhaps even the testes. And so another thing I wanted to mention is that we are developing this scaffold, which is, is new. It's, it's a different type of way of thinking about architectures. And there are other organ bioprostheses that could be developed with this scaffold. For instance, the islets from the pancreas are also spherical, and they produce insulin. And there's also liver spheroids that are important for metabolism. So you can see that these could have wide-ranging effects. Now, this is just the beginning, but I really hope that I am, have an answer in the near future for this young girl who preserved her ovarian tissue in the hopes of restoring her hormone function and her fertility later on in life once she has survived her disease. Thank you.